Please stand and, and follow along with me as I read from Matthew chapter 2. It's on the screen, but if you'd like to take out a Bible and follow along in the Bible, that'd be fine also. Matthew writes, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who, he, he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it's written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The Christmas effect reached the Magi in Susa, Babylon, Persia, Iraq, or Iran, pardon me. They saw a star or a planet or an alignment of planets. They saw something in the night sky that they as astrologers understood to mark the birth of the king of the Jews. It may have been a new star that God created. It may have been an alignment of Jupiter, the planet of kings, and then another formation indicating the Jews, meaning the king of the Jews if these two things aligned. Whatever they saw, they interpreted it to mean the king of the Jews has been born. So a big question today is why did it affect them that much? Why did they come under the Christmas effect? What did, what did pagan spiritual leaders from the Persian Empire conquered by the Romans what did they have to do with Israel or with the Jews? What's the connection? What's the interest? What's the draw? Did Magi always travel to different countries to welcome new kings? A Caesar or a Pharaoh? If you traveled to welcome a new king in the Roman Empire and that king was not a Roman Caesar, you're guilty of treason and executed. What moved these magi to leave the comforts of their palace and come to Jerusalem? As I was writing this sermon, I put in the title, The King of Israel. As I looked at the text more closely in Matthew, Matthew doesn't say King of Israel. He says they came looking for the King of the Jews. 
That narrows it down. That leaves out 11 tribes and focuses it on Judah and the Jews, the king of the Jews. And then I recall what title Pilate put over Jesus when he was on the cross. Not the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. And Pilate put it in three languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. In Hebrew, the spiritual world could read it. In Latin, the political world could read it. And in Greek, the intellectual world could read it. The king of the Jews. I still don't get it. What drew these men to Jerusalem? Risking treason. Travel back then isn't like now. Once you get in your car and you're going 70 miles an hour, no one's going to touch you. Back then, the road was dangerous. There were thieves and bandits. So these wise men would travel with an entourage of soldiers and servants. It was a major ordeal for them to leave the capital city and anywhere they were greeted on the road, where are you going? Did they say we're going to greet the king of the Jews? No, they didn't say that. They probably didn't say much of anything. When they came into Jerusalem, all Jerusalem knew about it. And they brought a message that troubled not only Herod, but troubled Jerusalem. Why would they be troubled if their king is born? What drew these magi to this king? That question pressed on me more this year than ever before. Why? Then I read verse 12 in this passage. It says, They were divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. We understand dreams in the Old Testament. Joseph had a dream. Pharaoh was given dreams. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Daniel interpreted them. We understand God communicating with kings through dreams. This makes sense. These magi are not unknown to God. They're being cared for by God. And if they're being cared for by God in verse 12, which would protect them but also protect Jesus, then maybe the same God who sent them home a different route was the God who drew them to Jerusalem. Why? And why didn't other magi from other cities come? What is this Christmas effect on these men? Well, I'll share with you the first part of the Christmas effect happened to me yesterday, studying. The first thing that happens is fear and awe. Fear and awe. When Gabriel appeared to Mary, she was scared. She was afraid. Mary, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. When the, when the angel appeared to the shepherds, they were sore afraid, shaking, scared to death. And then their fear becomes awe. An angel is talking to me. What is going on? Fear and awe. As I read a little bit about the Magi and why they may have come to Jerusalem, I began to come into awe at how God had this all planned. True or false, the Babylonians conquered the Jews in 586 B.C. Please say true. That's right. You got it right. Maddie, you knew that, didn't you? Right on it. When they conquered the Jews in 586 B.C., did they just leave the Jews there to do their own thing? No. They took the scholars like Meredith with them. They took them to Babylon to serve in the king's court. Remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? These are young men, Jewish men, Hebrew men. They took them out of Judea and took them to Babylon and said, now you will learn our literature and you will learn our ways and you will have a new name and you will be Babylonians. Well, Daniel and them said, okay, but we don't want to eat your food. Could we eat our food? We'll be healthier. And you know the story they were. 
You know the story that Daniel was challenged as the top wise man. You know the story that the lions could not consume Daniel in the lion's den because God, God was proving this man belongs to me. And Daniel rose to the top of the Mede Empire. He'd have been Darius' right-hand man. If four Jewish scholars are taken from Judea and they go to Babylon, what's the first thing they're going to put in their, in their luggage? The Torah. They could care less about their clothes. They could care less about their food. They're going to bring the Word of God with them. So they brought it to Babylon. And when Daniel becomes the top wise man, magi, Chaldean, soothsayer, whatever you want to call it, when he becomes number one, don't you think he shares the Torah and the Psalms and the books of Israel with everybody in Babylon, with all the wise men? He may have even required them to read it. I want you to know this. The magi knew the word of God. They knew there was a king coming to Israel, to the Jews. That's interesting, okay, but what's in it for them? Why would Persian or now Roman magi come to Jerusalem? What? Why? Why do you come here? You come here because you're a Christian. Perhaps you're saved here. You know people here. You know why you came here. Something drew you. What drew them? It wasn't enough just to know that the king of the Jews might be born. As I studied more, one of the writers said, in the time of Queen Esther, so I had to look up, okay, when was Queen Esther? After Darius the Mede is conquered by Cyrus the Persian, Cyrus's next king was called Ahasuerus or Xerxes. That was the king when Esther became his queen. It's about 500 B.C. or 475 B.C. It says in the Bible that after Esther won the victory over Haman, that many people became Jews. Wow. How's it all? Wow. Many people in the Persian Empire became Jews. Then that empire was conquered by the, by the Romans, but it's still the same people with the same knowledge, and they passed down the same things from generation to generation. What's more, Balaam, years ago, gave a prophecy. He didn't want to. God made him. That said, a star will arise out of Jacob. A star. What's more, Daniel said, from the time of the command to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah is cut off shall be 62 weeks and, and seven weeks. And then one more. Or 63 and then one more. 62 and 7 and 1. We studied that in Revelation. If they figure that up, it's 483 years, they realize that Cyrus gave the command for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. You measure 483 years, you take the account that many of them became Jews, you remember what Balaam said, that a star will arise out of Jacob, and you look in the sky and you see the star that signifies the king of the Jews is to be born, and all of a sudden you're a Jewish magi in Babylon, and you said, we gotta go. We got to go see this. Our man is born. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what risk we take. We have got to go honor our king, the king of the Jews. I was like, wow. And that may be too much Bible for you or too much history or too much detail. But that's why they came. These men had a personal spiritual interest in Jesus. This wasn't just a passing king. Jesus would be their king, our king. That's cool. The Magi were in fear and awe when they saw the star. They knew what it was. They told each other, this is it. 
This just as was prophesied right at the right time. And the second effect of Christmas is wonder and expectation. Raise your hand if you have ever taken one of your wrapped Christmas presents that someone was giving you and you shook it or you listened to it or you weighed it. Are you wondering what's in the box? I wonder what's in there. Isn't that fun? I mean, a few of you that are more advanced would slip the tape off, take a peek, put the tape back, and stick the present back. My brother did that. I would shake the boxes, but I wouldn't sneak in and unwrap them and wrap them back. But we're different. Wonder and expectation. The Magi are asking, what is going to happen? What's going to happen? How is he going to overthrow Rome? How is he going to save the world? How is he going to deliver us? How is it going to happen? What's it going to look like? And they talked all the way from Susa to Jerusalem. What's, it, what's he going to look like? What kind of house will he be in? What kind of family will he be from? And they get to Jerusalem expecting to find the king and Jerusalem knows nothing about it. It, un, it unnerved him for sure because Herod was very, very controlling. He learned when the star appeared so he could do something horrible. He wanted to stop this king of the Jews. And when the Magi didn't come back to tell him where Jesus was, Herod put to death the boys two years old and younger. Herod was crazy. That's the downside of the Christmas effect. The upside is wondering, God, how are you going to do this? How are you going to place Jesus? How are you going to place us? How is it going to happen? I'll have to confess, Summer and Beth, I'm wondering about the Christmas program, how it's going to come out, but I have lots of expectation, lots of anxiety. That's part of it. You know, Norma, you're going to be in it. Praise God you're in it. Ricky, study Norma's lines in case she passes out or something. Be ready to cover for her. Now we're looking forward to it. And Mason, I got an invitation for you. Don't leave without me asking you something. All right, I got something for you to do. Wonder and expectation. That's part of the Christmas effect. I mean, Black Friday, I wonder what price I'll get. Cyber Monday tomorrow, I wonder what price I'm going to get. Oh, I've a it's all part of the season. A lot of it's secular, but let's come back to the spiritual part. What is God going to birth in us and in Trinity this season? What's he birthing? In a moment, Ashton's going to come up and share with you a testimony about why she laid down her microphone two weeks ago and came to the altar. Why'd she do that? Lastly, let me tell you about the, the high point of this Matthew 2 passage. The Magi experienced incredibly wonderful joy. And they experienced an anointing and joy. Anointing because they came in the presence of Jesus himself. And joy because they had traveled two years when they saw that star appear over the house, that confirmed to them, you did the right thing, you've come to the right place, you're on target. Don't you love it when God confirms it to you? You did it right. You're in the right place. That is very exciting. I could, I could really go. Uh, Clay, I don't know what time it is, but I could really preach on the excitement of, Lord, I thought I was in the valley, I thought I was lost, I thought I was stepped out on a crazy mission. And then God confirms it. You see the fruit. You see the outcome. That's exciting. That's the anointing of God. Well, they saw the star. They saw Jesus. They gave him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold because he's a king. Frankincense because he's a priest. And myrrh because he's a sacrifice, he's a prophet. Already set up, already foretold. 
I didn't get a chance last week to connect to you that Nicodemus brought myrrh and aloes to the tomb to anoint Jesus. The same kind of myrrh that was given to him at his birth. Anointing and joy. Christmas, the Christmas effect is about Jesus. Just Jesus. There's lots of characters. I saw a musical last Saturday, an enjoyable play. But four fifths of it was fiction. Fiction. And when it came to the real part, the biblical part, I perked up. I'm like, wow, that's cool. It's about Jesus. Let me take us back to the fall revival. Just, just for 30 seconds, I want you to hear Dr. Calhoun again tell us it's just Jesus is what we're looking for. Clint, could you play those clips, please? They, meaning the people who had them on. Bill, we need sound. They, meaning they, meaning it the people who had them on there trial, the ones who crucified Jesus or had him crucified, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That was the only thing they could figure out. That's the most outstanding characteristic of their lives. They've been with Jesus. It's just Jesus. That's where it begins and that where it, that's where it ends. It's just Jesus. He hit the nail on the head. He affected us. God used Brother David to affect us deeply that night and other nights of the revival. But particularly that night. Ashton, would you come and tell us what happened a couple weeks ago? Why did you come to the altar? And I'll always invite you to come and tell it. If you come to the altar, that's personal between you and God and those with you at the altar. But this time I was led to ask Ashton to share with you why she came. 